Good morning. My name is Cindy Kessler, and welcome to the workshop, Coping with the Stress of Caregiving. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Monks. Dr. Elizabeth Monks is the Clinical Director of Psychology Services for the Hematology and Cellular Therapy Division at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. She specializes in counseling transplant recipients and their caregivers, focusing on quality of life, sleep disturbances, and the connection between physical and psychological health. Please welcome Dr. Monks. Good morning. Thank you so much for that introduction. And good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm excited to be here talking about um, dealing with the stress. Not excited about talking about the topic, but um, you know, excited to be here with you all and definitely um, very much dedicated to, you know, making sure that we are paying attention to our caregivers uh, because the role that you play um, is so critically important that um, I'm really happy to be able to spend some time this morning talking about the stress of caregiving and how to how to get by because I know it is, it is not an easy task. So um, I'm going to start um, by kind of just hitting some of the highlights of what I plan to talk about this morning. Um, just a brief overview of some of the cancer caregiver statistics, um, reviewing some of the caregiver responsibilities, which of course are not new to, to you all, um, and, and also speak a little bit about the unique position of DMT caregivers. I think um, our, our caregivers who are taking care of folks who are going through auto or allo or car T um, you know, procedures uh, have a bit of a different story um, caregiving wise than some of our other cancer populations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the unique position um, that our BMT caregivers can be in, the emotional and mental health concerns. Um, of course, we can't get away without talking about the impact of COVID-19 on caregiving. Uh, and then I want to just briefly discuss the stress um, screening for caregivers as a, a pilot that we are trying out here at the cancer center that I work at at KU. Um, so give you guys some signs of caregiver burnout to be on the lookout for and then also of course talk about some resources and ways to cope and handle and manage all the all the stress. So our cancer caregivers um, play play a huge role um, and as we know as you know, more and more people are diagnosed with cancer, surviving cancer, there's more and more caregivers out there, right? So we've got about 16.9 million cancer survivors and about 22 million by 2030. So my goodness, how many caregivers are there involved in the care of all of those, those patients? Um, about 75% of families have at least one member um, in their family who is a cancer survivor. Um, and we have about 23,000 23, stem cell transplants performed each year. That number is um, on the rise and probably higher, um, especially as we are considering doing more and more CAR T cell therapy also. And our caregivers, caregivers typically in the cancer realm provide about 75 to 80% of care, which, which is a lot. Um, an average of about 8.8 .8 hours of care a day. Um, and so it's it's no it's no lie when you say it's a, a caregiving is a is a job um, a nonstop job that doesn't that doesn't ever really give a lot of a lot of leeway in some ways. And then on average, more than four years of caring over the over the course of the cancer journey. So that is a lot a lot of needs and a lot of caring. Uh, caregivers have many many different roles. Um, they provide unpaid care and health-related assistance, medication um, acquisition, so, you know, ordering the medications, picking up the medication, giving the medications, tracking the medication, so many, so many things um, medication-wise I think is one thing that is kind of unique to this population of folks is our, you know, our transplant patients are on a boatload of medications at any given point. So I know the caregivers have a lot of management to do there symptom management, um, cooking meals, preparing meals, uh, making sure patients are eating to the best of their ability, uh, supervising, ensuring adherence, um, and of course, 
the usual errands, bill paying, providing emotional support, um, coordinating care with everyone. I mean, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen when it comes to going through a uh, stem cell transplant and coordinating all that care. Uh, I think caregivers often tell me that coordinating um, is sort of feels like it's a job in and of itself. Um, and then all of the communication uh, with providers, which can be, um, you know, in some ways, I'm sure it goes really smoothly. And I know communication is always challenging. So I know that that role for caregivers can be a frustrating one sometimes in trying to coordinate all the care and communicate with everybody. The caregiver is an essential member of the team. Um, I, I sometimes refer or have heard our caregivers referred to as the invisible member of the medical team. So we've got these very visible, you know, doctors, nurses, transplant coordinators, um, people who are on board in a very visible way that we forget that our, you know, our caregivers um, are more informal, so to speak. Caregivers are a huge member of the medical team also. Like, we need you. We cannot do this without you. Um, the social support is invaluable. Um, our caregivers are essential, like essential to good treatment, optimal treatment, um, ensuring compliance and continuity of care. Um, we actually see across the board in cancer caregiving that the stress is actually sometimes higher in our caregivers than in the patients themselves. Um, and there's a little citation there with higher, specifically higher levels of anxiety for the caregiver than the patient especially when the cancer is, is incurable. Our BMT caregivers, um, I think some, some of the unique aspects uh, that sets, sets you all apart is the long-term commitment to care, um, whether it's an autologous, an allogeneic, um, a CAR T cell patient. The caregiving is not just a quick one and done weekend, week or two. These are long-term commitments to 24-7 caregiving. Um, and, and those needs change by stage of survivorship, whether, you know, your first day, you know, at home out of the hospital after an allogeneic stem cell transplant, or maybe you hit your 100 days, but the GVHD is still a huge concern. It, I mean, the we can talk and get into all the different needs, but I, I really want to highlight that caregivers are navigating all the changing needs all the time, um, and at, it depends on the stage of survivorship what those needs and caregiver responsibilities might look like. Um, there is not only a significant life disruption um, to the transplant recipient, but also the caregiver's life is hugely, is hugely um, impacted as well. Um, and often our caregivers are, are trying to manage multiple roles, not just being a caregiver for a transplant recipient, but all their other roles, whether that's, you know, what they do for work, you know, husband, brother, uncle, friend, um, church member, colleague, all the other roles that they, they may play. Um, and then just a lot of fear and uncertainty that comes along um, with the tasks of, of being a, a transplant caregiver. I also think it's um, unique that we ask a lot of our caregivers during the, the transplant process, and there's very little, very little medical training um, pre-caregiving, unless you happen to be one of the lucky ones, right, where your caregiver, you know, some of my patients are like, well, my my daughter is going to be my caregiver and she's a nurse, you know, or my husband's going to be my caregiver and, you know, he works in the medical field or my, you know, my partner is is somebody that is a doctor. Um, unless, unless you have the luxury of having um, a medical background, we don't give a whole lot of medical training and yet we ask a lot of caregivers when it comes to medical care. And I feel like it's a steep learning curve, like for myself to understand everything that our patients go through. So I imagine it's a steep learning curve for our caregivers also. Um, the medication management, like I mentioned before, um, decision making and monitoring symptoms, um, making sure that you're doing everything to decrease risk for infection, um, being the enforcer of rules and restrictions, this kind of um, bad cop idea is something that comes up uh, when I when I meet with our caregivers and, and patients often where 
the patient is really feeling like they're, you know, being told what to do and how to do it, and they don't have any independence, and um, the caregiver really feels like they have to be this bad cop sort of enforcing rules and restrictions. And, you know, when I talk about that with our caregivers and patients, I often, you know, very much validate patients feeling like they want their independence and nobody really likes being told what to do or how to do it. But then we, as a medical team, we essentially ask our caregivers to be the bad cop. You know, they're not in clinic under our care all the time, under our watch. So we essentially ask the caregivers to do all of that enforcing. Um, and it's not, a, it's not a job anybody asks for or signs up for. Um, and then, of course, the post-transplant complications um, that can arise, whether that's related to various organs or GDHD or cognitive functioning, um, you know, sexual health. Or, I mean, there's all kinds of long-term impact that can potentially come into play um, post-transplant as well. So some of the, the common questions that um, caregivers have posed to me are things like, when do I stop being a caregiver? Um, I don't know how to pull back. There, you know, there is so much responsibility placed on me. How do I get back to my own normalcy? Um, I've had caregivers say things along the lines of like, nobody really understands what this is like, um, or I don't think I've had a chance to really process all the things that I've been through and sort of my responses to all of this being, you know, being diagnosed with a, a leukemia or a lymphoma or a multiple myeloma or, you know, whatever the case may be, you know, the caregivers have their own responses. And I feel like a lot of times they pause their own processing and their own experiences because they're busy doing this 24 seven all encompassing caregiving, um, which which makes it hard for caregivers to take a lot of time to, to care for themselves and the urgency with which caregivers get involved um, with many, many expectations thrown out. We don't always do a great job of saying like, okay, we throw you in the deep end, but then how do we back you out? And I feel like that can be a difficult thing to, to navigate sometimes. Like, okay, when do I pull back? When can I kind of let go? How do I start to find my, my normalcy again? When it comes to caregiver, specifically caregiver mental health, and some of the things that we see specifically for our BMT patients and caregivers, um, is that with depression, there's a three and a half times more risk for depression several years after transplant among spouses of, of uh, stem cell transplant recipients. So we see a risk for depression um, even after the fact, like several years down, down the line um, for spouses specifically. Um, for sleep prior to stem cell transplant, um, caregivers report significantly higher levels of anxiety, stress, and insomnia. So as things are really kicking up into high gear, I feel like this kind of makes sense as you're getting ready and going through all of the what I think sometimes feels like maybe organized chaos prior to the stem cell transplant, you know, we see more anxiety, more stress, and more insomnia in the, in the caregivers. Um, anxiety, less social support, greater marital dissatisfaction, um, loneliness, less spiritual wellness than their peers are all things that, that, um, that are not only reported, just kind of objectively, um, or subjectively, I should say, but things that we see objectively when we when we look at the research as well. Um, our our BMT caregiver needs um, are are significant. Uh, I'm not sure that there's any any other way to say that we have to make sure that we're we are paying attention to our caregivers' needs as well, physical and emotional needs. Um, I feel like there can be a lot of isolation. Um, struggling to know how much to, to push either yourself or even push, you know, the person you're taking care of. Um, close, closer relationships may come to play when you're doing this intimate caregiving, um, but that can also put a huge strain on the relationship as well. Um, there's a significant need in learning to, to cope and help the patient cope as well. So like not only as a caregiver are you 
coping yourself, but this huge, you know, cancer diagnosis and stem cell transplant and treatment is all something that you are probably also helping your loved one, you know, cope with as well. Um, and then that formal and informal self-care is often neglected. Um, you know, caregivers are so busy. It's really, really hard. And I think they often, you know, put themselves last um, just because, there, sometimes there's no choice. There's no choice but to focus on all of the responsibilities that there isn't a lot of time for, for quote-unquote, self-care. Um, I think um, the impact of COVID-19 has been kind of interesting. I've heard, I've heard lots of different things from patients and caregivers. On one hand, um, I think it's very interesting that a couple of, or not a couple, many of my patients and caregivers that I see on a regular basis um, have said, I feel like the rest of the world has just joined us, right? So COVID-19 happened and now the rest of the world is either doing what we already have been doing to get through stem cell transplant masking, being really aware of infection, staying away from people, um, staying in the house in some ways, you know, it's like, oh, you know, look, everyone in the world is doing what, what we do day in and day out or what we already know how to do. And so there's a, a bit of resiliency and experience prior um, to COVID. But also, I think the impact has also been high for our caregivers um, with increased need for sort of being the gatekeeper. Um, I feel like our caregivers have gone in and out of limitations in attending visits or being with patients when they're in the hospital. Um, of course, just increased anxiety and fear when we know, you know, our significantly immunocompromised patients being at super high risk for COVID, um, you know, creates a lot of fear and worry for, for caregivers. Um, and then also, you know, caregivers that have had to navigate you know, possible exposures or even a uh, COVID, you know, COVID-19 positive status and how that impacts being able to care give. Um, less people being able to assist with caregiving due to COVID, the additional stressors of work or finances or childcare or everything else that COVID has touched, um, but especially the support networks being drastically impacted um, so I, I, I don't think the, the impact of the coronavirus has been light. It has been, it has been a, significant, a significant one. The next slide is just um, a little capture and might be a little hard to read and, and a little blurry, but it's mostly just a, a reminder um, for me to talk a little bit about something that we are piloting here at uh, the University of Kansas Cancer Center in our BMT clinic is actually measuring caregiver distress. I think the most, in place, most important place to start when we're trying to support our caregivers is to actually ask them how they're doing, like, and not just a hey, how you hanging, to which most caregivers say fine, <laughs> but um, what about actually sitting down and asking the caregiver about their distress? We do this for our patients, and I think many cancer centers do um, screen for distress for the patients, but um, what about caregivers? So we are piloting a specific caregiver distress screening tool that mimics the patient screening tool, distress screening tool that we use. It's got a, a couple of differences, a couple of different questions that are more applicable for caregivers than patients. And this is something that we're piloting um, in our BMT clinic and also in our head and neck cancer populations. These are two groups um, where caregivers have a high amount of stress. So this distress screening is given for, um, to caregivers to fill out when they're away from the patient. Um, and then there's a follow-up phone call just because we, we know that caregivers probably don't really want to get into all of the stress they're carrying in front of the person that they're caring for. Um, I mean, I, I think the communication is and can be very open and patients and caregivers are probably very much aware of each other's stress at times, but we wanted to also make sure that we were giving caregivers an opportunity to, to kind of speak freely also. 
so this is something that is very near and dear to my heart and looking forward to seeing what kind of you know results we get as we continue um, piloting this and I'm assuming that our that our referrals um, specifically to psychology for caregivers may increase but I think that's a that's a that's a good thing that we have the ability to provide some some resources and some psychological care to our caregivers in addition to our patients or at least be able to help them with some some resources. Some of the the major red flags for when when I think like when am I really really worried about a caregiver? I know that the stress day in and day out is there and that at baseline our caregivers are probably finding um, all of their responsibilities to be challenging, but some of the things that really make me stop and think like, ooh, okay, what, what's going on? That, that's a red flag. A noticeable change in appearance, um, a, a change in communication style. So like maybe somebody who's usually pretty extroverted is now very, very quiet, um, obvious changes in behaviors. Um, when the patients tell me, you know, hey, Dr. Monks, I'm really worried about my sister or I'm really worried about my significant other. Or I'm really worried about my friend who's caregiving for me. When the patients express concern, I think that definitely needs to be listened to. Um, and of course, I think something we always need to be paying attention to is when there's a change in the complexity of the need. So something really drastic changes. So like you know, for example, our, the patient, get, you know, does contract COVID-19, right? There's a huge change in need here. And so that is going to probably put a huge stressor on the caregiver. And we definitely need to be paying attention and caregivers sort of paying attention also to themselves with what's going on when the complexity of the needs change, um, those are things that, that I think are important to, to be attentive to. Um, these are some of the signs of when a caregiver is burnt out. And I, I think, you know, some caregivers are like, yeah, so what? I'm burnt out. Like, I can't quit. I can't stop. Um, and that's 100% absolutely true. And I think sometimes just being aware of the burnout is critical because even though you know, many of our caregivers are like, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, of course I'm burnt out, but I have to, I have to keep going. Yes. And along with keeping going, we've got to find a way to help mitigate some of that burnout because sometimes the burnout gets so, so bad that then the caregiver is unable to provide caregiving and we don't want that to, to be the case. Um, so some of the signs of caregiver burnout include um, caregivers ignoring their own health problems or symptoms, um, eating poorly, overusing tobacco, alcohol, or other substances, um, giving up exercise if that was something that they were adamantly or, you know, doing pretty consistently, losing contact with friends, bottling up feelings of anger and frustration, outbursts, um, feeling resentful or unreasonably annoyed. I hit the, the nail there on the unreasonably annoyed because I'm sure there's lots of feelings of resentment and feeling frustration, but this is out. This is like, you know, this big, like not, not what's kind of the norm or the usual. Feeling anxious, distressed, sad, hopeless. And I put that two week, um, the two weeks in parentheses because when it's a it's a big indicator to me that in two weeks if there have been more bad days than good days so to speak or more days of feeling anxious and distressed and sad or hopeless um that doesn't really just have a break it's just at least two weeks of, or more of feeling that way that can be a, a sign of burnout um blaming the patient feeling tired all the time sleeping poorly trouble concentrating um, so, you know, there may be a different constellation of what burnout looks like for each person. Um, and one or two of these happening, you know, I think is probably to be expected of when I start to see caregivers that are like, check, 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 check to every single one of these things or a lot of these things. I think, oh my goodness, I'm so, I'm so worried that this, this caregiver might, might be burning out. Um, so what, right? So what do, what do we do about it? What can you do about it? What can, 
what can um, you know patients encourage their caregivers to do? What can caregivers do to to help mitigate some of this? Um, and this is just a, a slide with you know some of the visuals of some of the resources that I often utilize or point caregivers to. Um, our own BMT InfoNet has great resources for caregivers, including a Caring Connections program. Um, Be the Match also has great resources. They have a one-to-one -one, um, telephone support um, that I think is really to be really useful. I've had caregivers um, report back to me that that's useful. They also have the Caregivers Companion book, which has some great ideas and resources in it as well. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society um, has caregiver support resources. Uh, lots of Helping Hands is one that I was not familiar with until recently, and actually a caregiver um, told me about it, and I looked into it. It's very organizational, so it's kind of a practical resource with calendars and meal organization and ways to sort of coordinate um, others helping out, which is, which is great or just a way to kind of help get organized. Um, and then there are some um, online therapy options like Talkspace that can be helpful if you just need some additional support, but kind of on your own terms, whether you need to do that, like kind of by texting or online or telephone or whatever the case may be. Although with, um, with COVID-19, I feel like a lot of counseling support um, has transition to having a telehealth piece. And so that helps where patients are kind of able to to do and get that support wherever they are without having to break in their schedule to go to a physical appointment for themselves, which I know is always something that's been really hard when caregivers are like, I would really love to talk to a counselor or a psychologist or, or somebody, but like, when am I going to do that? Um, I do feel like in some ways COVID has helped um, us be able to get services to people a little bit easier with the telehealth option. Um, caring for the caregiver, um, sometimes uh, the, my patients will ask me, like, what can I do to help, you know, the person who's dedicating themselves to being my caregiver? You know, and I also, I often tell them, if you can encourage your caregiver to take some time off, um, finding even the smallest contributions that you can give to relieve feeling a burden. Many, many patients say like, I'm a burden, I'm a burden, I'm a burden. And the caregivers are usually saying, no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. Um, and it's, I, I can never bring myself to tell a patient, oh, you're, no, you're not a burden because how they feel is how they feel. And I think patients are very aware of the complexities and the challenges that their caregiver is is having to manage as well and it's hard for them not to feel like a burden so I often say like find if you can find one small thing that you can do even if that's like maybe you can't go down the steps to get the laundry and bring the basket up but maybe you can fold um, and put it on the bed or you know maybe you can't get up and cook a, a full meal but you can make the grocery list or you know finding just small um, contributions or little, you know, little ways to say thank you, whether that's just like a little note or, and I love you, um, whatever the case may be, um, you know, ways to, to show gratitude, which I think everybody appreciates from time to time, um, encouraging caregiver to utilize their own outlets. Um, being open and honest with the caregiver and, and being a listening ear also supporting um, their hobbies or activities that bring them meaning or joy um, and then being mindful of language so I'm, I'm going to to say I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth here for a second so I try to be mindful also of telling caregivers you need to do better self-care. You need to self-care, 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 self-care. And I think sometimes, like one time I think I said that to a caregiver and I swear she was going to, she looked like she was about to, you know, just lose her mind because I think everyone had been telling her that she needed to do self-care. And I think that sometimes that language can be very frustrating because 
caregivers are like, yeah, I know. Like, I, I'm aware of the fact that I need to take care of myself, but I am so busy taking care of somebody else that that self-care thing is almost like a joke, you know? And I, and I get that and I validate that. And, you know, I have not been in the position of being a, a caregiver for, I mean, I'm a caregiver for some cell transplant patients and that I am blessed to be in a position where I can help take care of the emotional and psychological parts um, for our caregivers and our, and our patients. But I myself have never been like a caregiver. Um, but when, when I'm stressed out and somebody tells me, you know, Hey Liz, you really need to do a better job of self-care. I kind of want to, you know, throw a punch and be like, you don't think I already know that. So I think finding ways, we all could find ways to avoid using that self-care terminology because sometimes I think it, it can be a little triggering or a little frustrating. And so, um, that brings me to talking out of both sides of my mouth because here I have self-care on this slide um, because I'm still trying to find ways to talk about self-care in language that feels a little bit more understanding and maybe that's, you know, not so much self-care, but like what one thing are you, can you do that might help relieve a little bit of that anxiety or relieve a little bit of that stress or, um, you know, and, and these are just some ideas. Um, obviously, sleeping, eating, and exercise are so, so important. And I, I think it's asking a lot for our caregivers to prioritize all of those things. So sometimes I, I just say, like, can you pick one? Or, like, what's the one you're going to try to focus on this month? Like, maybe this month you just focus on trying to, like, get some adequate rest or um, next week, you know, you focus on getting that exercise routine back in place, like one thing at a time. Mindfulness and relaxation practices can be helpful, asking for help and utilizing support, which nobody wants to ask for help, I know. So I often tell as many people as I can, if you know somebody who's caregiving, don't ask, what can I do? Don't say, call me if you need something. Find something to do and just do it because asking for help is something most people do not want to do. But if you are pressed and it really, you know, it is also okay to ask for help. And oftentimes many people are kind of standing in the background wanting to be helpful, but not knowing how to and giving them something to do can sometimes actually help them more than, than it helps you. Focusing on the things that you can control, celebrating small victories or finding a silver lining. Um, expressing feelings, scheduling a self check-in with journaling or some, you know, asking a friend to hold you accountable to just check in on how you're feeling from an emotional standpoint. And then practicing radical acceptance, which is this idea um, that you sort of have to um, accept life on life's terms. That's kind of how I think about radical acceptance. Um, because sometimes problems can't be solved and it can be really exhausting to fight against the reality. And I hear a lot of people say, and I've been guilty of saying, you know, I can't stand this. This isn't fair. It shouldn't be this way. But it's really, it's as though, you know, that refusing reality somehow will keep it from being true, but that doesn't really work. And so, um, finding a way to accept, which doesn't necessarily mean that you agree or that it's okay. It's just sort of accepting things as they as they are, um, because in life there are very painful things, and if you pair that with non-acceptance, you end up with suffering. And so, if you can at least pair the painful challenges, the things that you wish were different, with a bit of acceptance, it doesn't quite feel like it's so much suffering. So the, that idea of radical acceptance is leading me into a couple of just skills or like tangible, like I like to leave people with like, here's something that you can, that you can try, that you can do in addition to, you know, exercise, eating healthy, sleeping, um, you know, relaxation techniques, talking to your friends, utilizing your social, social supports. I think people know a lot about those ways to, um, to care for themselves, um, but this this skill right here is called using your wise mind, um, which I think that we have 
Um, some of us sometimes can be in more of an emotional mindset, or you might know somebody who operates from this kind of hot spot where reason and logic is just out the window and everything is driven by emotions, very reactive. Um, and then you might also know people that are more rational minded um, where they can kind of remove the emotion completely from the picture and just see the facts, very logic, logic, uh, research focused. Um, so I often encourage people to think about like either where they tend to land, if they tend to operate more from an emotional mindset or a rational mindset or think of like a movie character or a book character or um, somebody that kind of encapsulates um, that rational mind and somebody that kind of encapsulates that emotional mind. And sometimes um, finding a balance of those two can help with just general coping um, in your wise mind and tapping into your wise mind, which in my head is sort of like this wise Yoda, or if you've seen The Lion King, my wise mind character is Rafiki, the like very wise monkey, um, which is a balance of two of these things. Like you need both to keep your feeling, you know, keep yourself feeling like you're in a stable place. And so sometimes I think when things get really hectic or really distressing, we have to pause and be like, okay, let me look at the rational side of things. Let me acknowledge the emotional side of things. And let me find this happy medium of my wise mind where I can kind of just sit and be intuitive and be in the moment and find a balance between these two. So I don't feel so out of whack um, or off balance. Um, I think that this um, wise mind accept skill, so a couple of these skills are, um, you know, each letter of the skill name stands for something. So um, this is a, a little skill set that I think is helpful for like in the moment, um, trying to get through, you know, a really tough week. Um, trying to engage in some kind of activity that helps you feel a little bit better, um, contributing. I know our caregivers are already doing a lot of contributing, but sometimes um, dropping a little note in the mail for someone else or, you know, handing a bottle of water to the other caregiver in the waiting room or um, whatever you can do um, from a contributing standpoint can sometimes it can help to do something for someone else. Um, comparisons, this one is, is good for some, not good for all the, like, it could be worse, um, the juxtaposition of like, or maybe a previous time in your own life when things are really hard. Um, I think the comparison piece is, is tough. Some people really do find it helpful to think like, oh my gosh, this could be worse. Um, and sometimes I think that comparisons is not a good fit for people and it's not a very helpful approach. So I just throw that out there as like a potential. I know that works for some and not for others. Um, doing something to change your emotion or generate a different emotion than the one that you're currently feeling. <clears throat> um, and this could be like, okay, I've got to turn the news off and turn on, you know, my favorite sitcom or I've got to watch kitten videos or I've got to do something that changes my emotions. Um, I had a caregiver one time tell me that when she was in a really, when she was in a funk, she would go and read like the funniest greeting cards at the Hallmark store, which I thought was really interesting. Um, she just always said that like she would find the funniest cards and they would make her laugh and that would help at least change her emotional state for, for the temporary. Um, sometimes we got to just push away the bad stuff. And like I said, these are, these are things to just get you through these, these different skills aren't necessarily going to change everything, um, but they can help in the moment. Um, so kind of putting feelings and tough stuff up in the, sh on the shelf and saying like, I can put this away for now. It's not going anywhere. I don't have to give it all my energy right now. Um, doing something to change your sensations, like taking a hot bath or drinking warm tea or using something that grounds you to your, to your senses. The last skill that I will just really quickly run through, because I know we're running low on time here, is a skill that's, that's called improve the moment, which is designed for helping when distress hits and it's high and you got to do something in the moment just to get through. Not going to solve the problem, but it's going to get you through a distressing moment. 
Um, and again, here we have each letter of the skill name stands for something. So I stands for imagery. So bringing to mind a really beautiful image that you can think of or thinking about a place that you visited that was really beautiful. There's research that shows that the same parts of the brain are stimulated. So if I go to the Rocky Mountains and I see this beautiful mountaintop with a lake at the bottom, I get all of these really positive brain chemistry things going on. You know, 10 years down the line, if I can pull that image to my head, the same parts of the brain light up so they can help um, change the mood or make you feel a little bit better. Doing something you're engaging in, something meaningful, engaging in prayer, if that's something that's helpful to you, if, if spirituality or religion is not something that's high on the priority list, you know, this can be a mindful meditation or a tapping into spiritual or higher power of some sort. Um, doing something for relaxation, I think most people know themselves best um, for how they relax best doing something mindful or something that grounds you to just doing one thing in the moment. Um, a vacation, which yeah, sounds great, right? Every caregiver wishes they could take a month off and go to Hawaii, I'm sure. But I think vacations can be, you know, as simple as like jump in bed, pull the covers over your head for five minutes and just take a break. Or, um, you know, the vacation, you know, could be a weekend getaway or whatever you can make work, even if it's just a five minute vacation, sometimes that can help. And then remembering to be your own cheerleader and encouraging um, to, to acknowledge all that you've been through, all that you've contributed, and somehow you're still standing. Um, both our patients and especially our caregivers have an incredible amount of resiliency. Um, and so I think sometimes reminding yourself just how resilient you are and that you are still standing is really, really important as well. So I will wrap up there and make sure we've got some time for some questions or comments, and I will do my best to answer um, the questions that I can. Thank you so much for, for joining me this morning and, and tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Monks, for this excellent presentation. We will now take questions. As a reminder, if you have a question, please type it into the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. First question is, as a caregiver, I handle drugs from a cardiologist, neurologist, transplant doctor, so I deal with 20 to 30 drugs a day for my husband. The neurologist refuses to talk to me even though I have a power of attorney and, um, and a health power of attorney. Any suggestions for better communications without involving a lawyer? I think that's a really great question. Um, I have a couple thoughts. So um, if there is a way to like directly have a discussion with the medical team member who's not being so great on the communication end to say like, hey, you know, it's my job to manage all these things and I really need your input and your support, you know, I... I have permission to discuss, you know, medical care. So could, you know, what can we do? What can I do to improve this communication? Or how can we, um, how can we set up a, a communication pattern that works so that I can stay in the loop? Um, if, you, if it's possible to have that discussion with the provider, that's one route. Sometimes that just isn't possible. And so then I say, ask for help, like find that person on your medical team that you do trust, that you do have a good relationship with and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this nef nephrologist. Like, could you, you know, could you help me navigate this communication or could you reach out to this provider and let them know how important the communication is so that we can get on board? Um, I think utilizing the pharmacist um, can be helpful to when just not, like I think sometimes I forget that the pharmacists are a wealth of information themselves and so sometimes um, utilizing them for extra help um, whether that's at the pharmacy I I don't know how a lot of other BMT programs work but we have a pharmacist that works specifically in our clinic who is available to review medications and just kind of sit down with patients and caregivers and, and go through things and be helpful in the communication standpoint. So, um, you know, trying to reach out to that provider 
um, and ask, like, what can we do to get this communication on track or asking for some help to make that happen would be would be my suggestions. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next mm -hmm. question is explain living mindfully. Yes. I believe uh, you mentioned that. Yes. <laughs> sure. Um, I think living mindfully is uh, not conducive to the type of lives that we live that are very, you know, quick paced, high paced. So mindfully, mindfulness in a nutshell means in the present, not caught up in what's to come, not caught up in what's already happened because you can't change it, but being right here, right now. So to live mindfully is to at least and, and mindfulness is not new. It, it seems like it's kind of a hot word, hot topic, like we're teaching it in schools to kids so that they can be better at managing their emotions. We're using it in the corporate world because when people are mindful, they're more productive. We're using it in mental health because depression tends to be sort of past, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Anxiety tends to be very, what if this, what if that, future-oriented and so practicing being mindful and being right here, right now, sometimes helps um, pull us out of the future and out of the past. So to live mindfully means to live present, to be in the present. And this is not a new idea. Um, it's very um, Eastern religion, Buddhist based. And so if you can imagine like a Buddhist living in the Himalayan mountains, living this very like mindful life day in and day out where you just you know, you're here, you're here now, everything is as it should be, I'm focusing on my breathing, like, yeah, great, um, <laughs> the, the thing that I have the hardest time sometimes in teaching mindfulness to folks is that I find it hard to practice myself, so sometimes I think, like, if I'm just trying to practice what I preach, um, I have um, an app on my phone, actually, that, that triggers me, it just says, like, be mindful, and it gives me like a 60 second countdown. Um, and I try to stop whatever I'm doing if I can in that moment and just let my brain just be and just do one thing, whether that's drink my water mindfully or actually sit down and eat a meal mindfully, even if it's only five minutes of it or walk from the parking lot into the store mindfully, count my steps, count my breath. Um, so that's a long answer to saying living mindfully <laughs> just means trying to live in the present. Um, and it's a practice, which can be formal or informal, and it's also a philosophy. Um, mindfulness philosophy would also say, like, every moment is as it is. There's no good. There's no bad. It just is. So um, mindfulness is also trying to trying to trust your, your inner gut and not, not judging it as good or bad either. So short answer, mindful Thanks. living is living in the present. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. The next question is, how do I offer encouragement without seeming to minimize my patient's uh, fears? I want to tell her everything is going to be okay and that she needs, and she needs to be okay, but she has so much fear sometimes. That's a great, that's a great question. I think validation goes a long way. Um, and sometimes I think it's okay to say like, you know, I, I really do believe that things will be okay in the way that they need to be okay. And I recognize that right now things are not, you know, I think, uh, sometimes an and helps instead of a, but so like, I know that you're struggling, but it's going to be fine simply changing that, like, I know you're struggling and it's going to be okay, gives a little bit of acknowledgement to both sides, right? It's really tough and you're getting through. You're really scared and somehow you're you're making it day to day. Um, you know, things seem really hard right now and that doesn't mean they're going to be that way forever. So a little bit of, of both, um, I think goes a long way, a little bit of validation along with the encouragement. Thank you. Next question is uh, regarding caregiver support groups. Uh, do you recommend caregivers go to the same therapist as patients? Yes and no. <laughs> um, I, I, I think sometimes um, I often, I do often recommend that caregivers see a different 
a different therapist, especially um, because I think it's really important for caregivers to have their own space. And there are things that I think both patients and caregivers will not say in front of one another. So I think it's really, really important to have separate space. Although that being said, when there are joint sort of dynamic concerns, there are times where um, I will see the caregiver and patient together um, if that's helpful to get some things discussed in that format. Um, but otherwise, generally, I would say it's probably helpful to have different therapists. Thank you. Next question is, are there any resources you would recommend for keeping track of all the details of caregiving? Are there apps, notebooks, or anything like that? Um, yeah, so that, um, I think the uh, Lots of Helping Hand website can be helpful. The, I believe the um, cancer, um, cancer support community, I think has some good resources for like ideas for specific apps, um, that can be helpful. Um, I'm blanking on the name of it. If I can Google it while I'm looking, there are apps out there. I'm sorry. I'm kind of, uh, fumbling and knowing which ones off the top of my head are most, are most helpful, but that lots of helping hands one that I mentioned before, I know is a is more of an organizational one that is that is helpful. And there are other cancer caregiving apps that have like options for like note taking for appointments, a calendar, a schedule. Um, so I think if you if you search it out, it does exist. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is: um, I'm a stem cell transplant recipient five years out who is now a caregiver for my wife who is going through breast cancer treatment. I'm doing very well so far, but on some days they are very trying. Can you talk a little bit about someone in my situation? Uh, yeah, so I, I think that's a tough spot to be in, like having your own cancer experience and then, you know, probably being there receiving of a lot of care and then transitioning into being the caregiver. Um, I think it's probably important to pay attention into the role, the role shifts and the role changes. Maybe that's something that, you know, some, some people are like, I'm so happy to be a caregiver, but it's also scary, right? You've got two different cancer experiences um, and recognizing that, you know, you can probably use some of your experience and knowing what it's like to being on the notice what it's like to be on the receiving end of being somebody who's cared for. I think that puts you in a unique position of being a really great caregiver because you have experience and knowing what to do and what's helpful, but also it's different people, right? So it's also important to wow, recognize that you probably have some experience. Everybody is a little bit different and, you know, I think sometimes other people's cancer experiences can trigger things um, in your own experience. So I would say just sort of being mindful of what's coming up for you as you're being a caregiver and doing what you need to do to process that or catch things that come up as they do. Sounds like things are going really well so far, which is fantastic. Um, I would just say like when you have your own cancer background and then you become a caregiver for somebody else with cancer, it's, just, it's important to pay attention to what it brings up for yourself. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, I know it is wrong, but sometimes I feel resentful for my husband, uh, resentful of my husband. I'm working so hard to get help him get well, and he just doesn't understand how hard it is. So I, that sounds like a, a really familiar thing that many caregivers, um, I think, express, like um, feeling that resentment. And, and, you know, as the patient, I think there probably are a lot of things that our patients don't understand about the challenges of being a caregiver. And I don't think it's wrong to feel resentful. I think, um, you know, it's probably not a feeling most caregivers want to have. But I also think it's important to acknowledge, like, if you are feeling that way, you're feeling that way. And your emotions and your feelings are valid. Um, you know, I think it's important to have outlets to discuss that resentment because it's probably not 
something that you want to talk to, you know, your husband about like, geez, I really resent you. Get out of here. You don't get it. And I mean, and maybe in some ways it's helpful to express some of that also, but that resentment is something that's common that comes up that I feel like is really normal and is not, you know, wrong. And I think you don't even have to label it that way. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not right. It's not wrong. It just is what you feel in the moment and you have every right to feel that way. Um, you know, if there are ways to utilize your own outlets and, and try to get some resolve on that feeling, I'm sure it would, it would probably feel a little bit better because I know the, that resentment place is in a place that people want to stay in. But I do think it's important to acknowledge if you are there, um, that it, that it is what it is. And you have every right to, to feel that way. Um, cause the, the caregiving responsibilities are hard, are hard to understand. So I would say definitely not wrong. It is what it is and whatever you can do to, to, you know, utilize your own outlets to help move through some of that, um, is important. Thank you. We're, we're almost out of time. I think we could squeeze in one last question. It is, um, my spouse has a lot of mood swings from the steroids he is on, and it has taken a toll on the family. How do I help my children who are four and eight understand what is happening? That's a, a really great question. I think it's hard for even adults to understand what's happening when the steroids are on board. Um, you know, sometimes for kids, it, um, it can be helpful to sort of talk about, um, you know, there's you know, daddy with this medication and daddy without this medication. And even though, you know, or compare it to something that they understand, like, you know, if we give you a ton of sugar, you know, you're probably going to have a whole lot of energy. And, or if, if we, if you stayed up for two nights after, you know, you're up all night after a sleepover and you're really grouchy, um, there are some things that just have an impact, you know, some things that just make us kind of different versions of ourselves um, and trying to kind of help kids understand that there's sort of like one version of daddy when he's not taking this medication that he needs, but then there are some things that are versions of daddy that happen when, you know, when these medications are, are on board and we just kind of have to, we have to roll with it and know that it, it's not always going to be forever and, you know, encouraging kids to ask questions or talk to the other parent if they are worried or have concerns um, is important also. Thank you for that answer. Um, that will be our last question. And on behalf of BMT InfoNet and our partners, thank you, Dr. Mumps, for your very helpful remarks. And thank you, the audience, for your excellent questions.